Uh, the first, the kickoff we have uh, with a fantastic, fantastic picker. Um, uh, to me, he does incarnate that kind of uh, a bridge between uh, various disciplines. Uh, he's uh, at the same time a, a creative and a, a teacher and a teacher in entrepreneurship. So uh, he's the art artistic director of the uh, Menagerie uh, Theatre uh, in Cambridge. Uh, he's also um, a lecturer at uh, the Cambridge uh, Judge Business School uh, and a consultant in uh, creativity and business uh, in general. Uh, the first time I met him uh, in person, apart from you know seeing him on stage and so on, uh, it's really good memory because he really blew my mind uh, with um, all uh, that he knows and he incarnates about creativity. Please press the hand clap button, everybody, for Paul Bourne. Well, Thank you very much, Paul, for being with us tonight. Thanks, Sasha. It's quite interesting at the moment having a nasty cold. I've, I've moved from um, the Czech Republic, where I was working uh, the last two weeks, to Poland. Um, now I'm in Rotslav, where I was um, working a few years ago. Um, Rotslav was a European capital of culture, 2016. You probably know about this program. It's quite interesting. We talk about creativity. It's a kind of forced creativity where the European Commission gives lots and lots of money, lots of support, lots of kind of focus on two, what, uh, what are called normally the second or third cities of a country. Uh, so Liverpool was one in the UK. I think it's the only one directly. Um, there's been British uh, capitals of culture. There was Hull. I think Liverpool was the only uh, recent anyway, pure um, European capital culture. Derry was in Northern Ireland, I know. I've worked on a number of them. These are programs that hugely encourage creative kind of, um, you know, artistic endeavours. And at the heart of it is getting people um, to get involved, to get involved in the community, to have a focus and energy and to create stories. So that's what that's what that, that program does. And that's why I thought I could escape here to Rotslav and see some old friends and see how it kind of feels. It's quite interesting, the program. I've worked on three or four of them as an artist, um, focused mostly on audience development. Why do people want to come to uh, get involved in any, any kind of activity? Uh, don't, are there any Poles in the house today? Any Polish people here today? No? You can unmute yourself if you're Polish. You, or you don't either. No? Okay, I'll try not to say anything, but a bit, it was actually the, the, one of my all-time favourite kind of moments in cultural activity was uh, just before Rotslav became the European Capital Culture. I was invited as a member of the European Commission to, to listen to a presentation by the director of Rotslav 20, I think it was 16, um, talking about why culture and creativity was going to be so you know, important and creative industries going to be so important to the city. And they did this absolutely classic, I mean classic, um, research by a Polish company. And they did like all the interviews, they did everything. And then they did this huge, had the presentation, the mayor, the mayor's very dynamic, the head of arts and culture for Poland, all the people in this auditorium. And this guy gave this talk about why people go to cultural events. And um, he did all the reasons that people go to the opera, go to street theatre, go to rock concerts. And he did all these charts, and all, it could probably cost like, you know, 30,000 euros for this thing. And basically, I, he came, and so the conclusion was, absolutely, people in Poland will go to cultural events if there are beer and sausages. That was it. 30,000 euros worth of research to, to know that it was beer, beer and sausage was that. So that was it. So it's kind of classic kind of thing. But, but it says something about why people want to get involved in anything. They, you know, they want to be involved in community activity. They want to be part of a story. Um, they don't want to feel like it's not for them because culture can be seen as a very elite um, you know, uh, product. And part of the European capital of culture product was to make Yes, world-class uh, theatre, opera, whatever, but also really strong community stories. And one of the things I'm involved in, another Slovakian city, Kosice, which is the second city after Bratislava of, um, 
of uh, Slovakia is a legacy program and that is how do you continue to uh, once you've had a year of culture people are like, oh god I don't want to do any more bloody culture I want to be able to walk down the street without being accosted by a you know puppeteer or I you know I want to be able to you know not have to you know listen to opera being blared out at you know, in, 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 on the street as I walk around. It's about how you engage and get people involved. Now, I'm not here to talk about culture per se today, but as an artist, you know, I, I live and breathe cultural activities, at the heart of which are stories. And for me, um, creativity, creative processes are about stories. Um, and I think if there's anything I'm interested in, uh, both in the business world and in the um, theatre world or the, the arts world, is this kind of idea, what questions are you asking? And I'm super interested in this. As an artist, I think you divide yourself up into two areas, which is you're either the creator of a product or you're the interpreter of a product. Uh, or, or of, a, of a work of art, whether it's a play or a work of, um, you know, dance or whatever it might be, any kind of performance, anything like that, you are either going to create it for a, for a particular reason that you feel you have an energy, a desire to tell something, to tell a story, um, or you're going to then reinterpret someone else's kind of original work and then place it into a new context. So when we're working on um, theatre, and I'll give you a good example of a creative process that's kind of interesting, was we found a, a Russian uh, short story um, from uh, central uh, Russia by quite a well-known, but in Russia, but not very well-known international author called Platonov, not Chekhov's play Platonov, but Andrei Platonov, uh, a writer who, who like many um, artists, told great stories, and then he, he was so um, you know into the, the 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 living his life as an honest and true person, stopped making art and started working on the railways. Because he said, oh, I can't want to waste my time writing things and just creating things that people read and whatever. I want to do something real. So he believed his own kind of um, sort of you know philosophy and then went to work for 12 years on, as a railwayman, shoveling the snow off the tracks in Voronezh in central Russia, because he wanted to do something real, he didn't want to do something. But his stories and legacies um, continued, his, uh, his ideas were very interesting, he was actually quite against the, the communist, uh, the collective model, he was quite against it. And um, he wrote a story called um, The River Pochidam, which was a short story. And one of, our, one of my writers, and I've set up a, a project, which is you create a team of artists who become your associates. Okay, my company in Cambridge has a team of associates and the, the, the gift we give them and the gift they give back to us is we give them a platform for their ideas to be developed. So any one of you, I'm looking at 12 people here, could be an interesting associate artist who would come up with an idea, it works exactly the same in business as it does in the arts, would come up with an idea and then you would come to us and say, look, can you collaborate on this idea? Um, and it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a classic kind of system for generation of ideas. So this guy, um, Fraser, who wrote the play that I'm gonna to talk to you about for a moment, um, was reading an article in the New York Times about this lesser known Russian writer. He had some great stories. He became interested. He read one of the short stories. He phoned me up and says, I've got an idea for a play. You know, would you, would you pursue this with me? And so we looked at it and I thought, well, what is the value of this play? Why would I want to do it? And it's a very interesting disruptive uh, disrupting this sort of classic kind of status quo story of how we live our lives now, even though it was set in 1920 Civil War Russia. So, so the, the, the creative process came from, I have an idea, can you collaborate? You know, here's, here's the question that I have. So we took a, a short story and we made it into a, a play, a single line, a single line, a single idea. I'll give you an example. The, uh, the, there's a moment in the short story, it's only 12 pages, The River Pochidan, where it says there's a, there's a, a young husband, uh, a young man meets a girl. The father of the young man who then goes off to war is alone with the young girl. And in, in one moment, he's, he just thinks he's, he has carnal desires for this girl, even though it's the wife of his son. And that's all it says in that one moment. It flashed across his mind. Well, of course, that one moment becomes an opportunity to explore something much more interesting. So in the play, we made this one thought 
and we explored it. What would happen if he kind of pursued that? So we asked the question, what would happen if? So that becomes part of, so we, we workshopped and worked on a scene with some actors with a rock to build up that what if this, act, this, this process was, and that led to a whole building of a structural story, which remained true to the original framework, but in fact, became something much uh, deeper. I'm not gonna say we're deeper than Platonov, but deeper in terms of how much it dug down in terms of exploring time and space and that particular story, and then making sure that it became kind of valuable to us. The interesting thing about this was that, that by definition, when you're working on something, we have a small kind of following. Once you put your social media ideas out there and start telling people what you're doing, all of a sudden, like a little magnet, people or, or moths to the flame, people start saying, oh, I understand you're doing a Platonov story. There's probably only 12 people in the world that care that we're doing a Platonov story, but that's enough because you're only one to say, I'm from the Platonov society. Who knew there was one? There's a society for everything. Okay, I'm in this city in Russia. You are doing a play about Platonov. Can you bring it here? And suddenly the chain reaction starts. And so the question is, would we like to take it there? Yes, of course we would, it'd be amazing. And suddenly, well, we have the phrase taking Coles to Newcastle. Suddenly we're taking a Russian play to Russia with, when, you know, and it's, you know, we didn't make it for them. We made it for us, made it for a British audience you know and and then suddenly it becomes like oh my goodness gracious me you know we really feel like both great excitement and great trepidation because now we're going into the place we're going not only are we going to russia with a russian story we're going to his hometown you know we're going to where you have a platonic relationship this is a play about platonic relationships so off we go from the seed of an idea to a collaboration to finding ourselves in this most extraordinary momentum and evolution of an idea. And there we are in Russia presenting this play. It now has evolved and developed. It was very well received. We learned a lot because we went somewhere with an idea that was naive. I'm going to come and talk about naivety in a minute. It's my greatest strength. Um, and, uh, and we learned that actually our naivety was in one sense a great you know, a powerful dynamic, but it also led us to make some mistakes which were then rectified. And then the product, coronavirus accepting, was com coming back to stronger and, you know, uh, more, more well-formed, more well-evolved um, back to the UK. That's the kind of introduction to the sorts of um, processes that we, we get involved in. And, the, and I just want to say something else about um, about creative process and, and, and elongating models um, of creative process. Um, the reason I was in the Czech Republic um, was, well, was, was twofold. One was because the theatres are closed in the UK, they're not closed here in Prague, or when I was in Prague, you know, the last few, last couple of weeks, they're not being closed. So I went where the work was, I went where the opportunity was. Now, obviously we've been very creative, under lockdown we've been doing digital work we've all reacted we understand that you guys i'm looking at right now you've all done the same i'm sure you've reacted to the to the to the restriction we understand that restriction is a massive part of creative um you know we push down and therefore we get a reaction we understand that so so yes yeah, so the reason i was here was um, a very simple model which a very simple model which people love is that we develop new plays as you've heard me talk about from an idea we have a big associate model I think 24 associate writers they come with an idea we develop we give them small amount of money we give them time we give them space then we do that work and it's you know it lasts maybe six weeks sometimes six months and then it's finished we've done it we can't sustain it anymore and we do that dreadful thing where you take this beautiful scenery or whatever it might be and you have to stick it on the bonfire because you can't afford to store it and whatever happens but what we, what we learned was actually there was a market for new work if you translated it. By definition, it seems so obvious. So we translated it into Czech. We translated the work into Russian. We translated the work into French. We translated the work into Serbian. But we didn't just say, here's the script and hope for the best. We came and said, we will meet with partners, with collaborators, and we will make this work last longer. 
So we will find a creative solution of longevity for our work. So now I have four plays here um, in, in the Czech Republic. I have um, two plays in um, Poland, one play in Germany and so on and so forth. And they, have, they are now living in a very different model, sustainable kind of creative model. So, so that, that was the reason that I was in the Czech Republic was to look at what would be the next um, process or next opportunity. And I came um, with two plays and actually what happened was we decided that we wouldn't just do those plays, we would create something new and we would mix Czech and English language and we create something by being in that, in that sort of uh, maelstrom of disruption and idea creation, we were thinking, well, actually we can shift our model now from just translating something in one pattern into creating something completely new in two, two languages. So that's what we're now looking at and, and you know, challenging our own model of, of, of creativity, therefore working with a Czech playwright and a British playwright to create something in dual language that could work both in the UK and in the Czech Republic. And if that model starts to work, then we'll look at it in other languages and other countries as well. So we create another kind of opportunity for our creative um, process. So that's what, that's, what we've, uh, that's what we've been doing in the last couple of weeks. Okay, so, so I wanna tell you a couple of little stories. Yeah, I did, I did, I did a talk um, in uh, end of last year at UEA, um, University of East Anglia, and, and, and with, for a friend of mine, and um, very nice um, friend, long-term friend. And, and, and I said, what was the feedback after the talk? And she said, one of the students said, um, it was great, but he only talked about himself. I thought, well, who else was I bloody well supposed to talk about? I don't know. Anyway, so, so I'm only going to talk about me, right? And I really, I was just like, I guess he wanted me to talk about some Steve Jobs or something, but, um, but um, I can talk about Steve Jobs. I mean, you know, just, just, just talking about, thinking about, um, you know, uh, every, every, I understand there's a creativity lecturer um, listening in. I feel somewhat anxious and nervous now because I'm just like an absolutely naive kind of individual here. But, um, but I do love, I do love that, um, you know, I've probably all of these quotes, ever, every, every quote from history, I'm sure it's been absolutely bastardized and made up or, you know, ne these people never had ever said anything. It doesn't matter. But the Picasso one, which is inspiration finds you while you're working, whether or not Picasso said that doesn't really matter. I love it because it really makes me think I'm, you know, I'm now in Poland. I was in the Czech Republic. I came with one idea. I came here because I couldn't work somewhere else. I was forced into it. And, you know, now a new project and a genuinely interesting new project has come. So inspiration finds you while you're working. And I'm a real believer in that. You know, you get inside ideas, you explore, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I'll talk about myself um, a little bit longer. And um, I, I, I want to tell you a couple of uh, quick stories. But before I do, I guess, um, Sasha, the title of this, um, of this meeting was Why Have a... Was it, wasn't it Why Have a Meeting? No, that's uh, <laughs> why, why a creativity meetup. And the way the, the day we talked about it, we were like, "Ah, oh, that's an existential question." I actually, you know, okay. why, why do we exist? Right. You know, why? So, uh, so we that, all that the title or not? aren't we? So, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm making the mistake of asking after 15 minutes what I'm supposed to be talking about. I, but, but that's not that's not untypical. That's not untypical. Um, you know. Um, I did do, actually, I did, I did one of my all-time, I was really, actually, I was really rocking uh, 15 minutes into a, into a talk in, in, in Platonov's home city in Voronezh when, when it was revealed that only about 10% of the audience spoke English and there was no translator. Um, that was, I was rocking on that one, actually. Speaking, um, speaking about that, um, as someone who is working across countries, uh, are there different ways to create in the UK and in Poland, Czech Republic, or other places? No, I, don't, I don't think so necessarily. No, it's about collaboration. It's about finding partners. I mean, look, I guess the reason I asked you that question, Sasha, about what is the title of this talk was because when we talked about it, you talked about having this, you know, you've got a little uh, community going here. Why, why, why bother to come together and so, and it is for me, uh, we all know, I'm telling grandma how to suck eggs here, which we, we, we can say that in certain countries, people have no idea what you're talking about. Um, but so anyway, I'm teaching grandma to suck eggs here for you guys, which is, is you know, uh, I don't want to go into some cliche kind of analysis of, you know, creativity is combining, you know, um, uh, 
ideas and whatever it might be, old ideas and create new patterns. And we understand that. But I do think the fact that we are here and I'm going to say something, probably not consciously, that is going to be a value to someone. It might just be that I think oh, I should be translating my work into different countries because I, it might be something. And the point of the meetup is by dialogue and communication. I mean, it's a bloody monologue at the moment. Um, but remember, I am my own favourite subject, as was established by the students of UEA. OK, you know, um, was, was that, that, you know, I might say something that is of value to people, you know, and, and that or in the debate, someone's going to get upset about something or cross about something. My God, this morning, you know, when I came, you know, down and talked to my friends, just have to talk about whether or not they're going to get vaccinated. Um, you start the whole conversation, let's go for it. It is like, you want to talk about, you know, I don't want to open this discussion up right now because I'm exhausted. The last time I got that exhausted was talking to my mother about Brexit. You know, I don't want to get that exhausted again. But just ask somebody about whether or not they want to get vaccinated. You know, when it, and, and of course, you know, there's so, it's, 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 you're going to get reaction. You're going to get reaction. Let's so, not go down that route. <laughs> Yeah, so let's let's not go down the vaccination. Yeah, no, no, I can't stand it. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I can't stand it. I'm really happy to talk about it, but I'm totally exhausted. Maybe we'll talk about it later. Maybe the, um, anyway. So 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 uh, I think the answer is um, is um, combinations, conversations. Okay, by definition, you can see I'm in a place where I'm looking for something to happen. I'm looking for a reaction. Okay, that's what I'm looking for, and, I, and I'm very interested in reaction. So where have I been? That, that why did I, I, we all get those times in life where you think, how the hell did I ever get here? How did I ever get here in this place, and why am I here? I'll give you five examples from my life. Okay, so you know that I'm a, a theatre director. You also know I teach at the Judge Business School. I created a business model, which was using my idea around creative processes, just essentially to, in a mercenary way, to sell it to businesses. And we became quite successful at one stage. In fact, we became so successful. We were traveling around the world working for a couple of big companies. And after a year, we realized actually we hadn't done any theater at all. And we were, we had a year, nearly 18 months where we had just, we were just going around with these companies doing all these creativity workshops saying, yeah, we're theater makers. And we do. And actually at the end of it, I thought, actually, we're not theater makers anymore. We're business trainers. And it became rather depressing. So, so we, we, we reframed the model again. But, but the point was, we had something that we thought was a value and people thought was a value as well. And what we did was, we freed ourselves from certain constraints around funding. And if you get into, I, I'm a big, big supporter of the Arts Council of England and other foundations that support the arts. And you guys working in uh, biotech or medical research, whatever it might be, you need those grants, you need that money. By definition, you then have to find yourself following a certain route. You know, not always, sometimes you'll get a grant which says, do whatever you think is the right thing. That's a great grant. Um, I haven't had too many of those you end up being a representative of a certain kind of way of thinking. Um, and we're a new writing theatre company. And again, you know, coming back to me, I didn't want to do any work that anyone else had ever done before. I just, I just felt like it, you know, I just didn't want to do it. And it hit me really hard when I was in New York. I went to New York and I, you know, I thought it was going to be the greatest thing I'd ever done when I was like 25. I was there for two and a half years. I was doing, you know, plays that had already been done, you know, like doing a Tennessee Williams play or something or you know, a Harold Pinter play or whatever it might be, then I realized that everyone had done this before and probably done it better. And I was struggling with that. I was really struggling with it. So I thought the only way to solve this problem with my own kind of depression over where I found myself, you know, uh, being judged against previous work and not doing it as well, or not doing it imaginatively enough, or I wasn't doing it kind of interesting enough, was to, do, to start from scratch. And to start with a blank piece of paper on every project. And it was tough at the beginning, but now we have momentum in this associate model. We have lots and lots of ideas coming our way all of the time. Okay, so, you know, that's, that's a, a, an important part of the process. Anyway, let's, so, so you guys understand that where I'm coming from. So this will make some sense about how I find myself in certain places. So the first place I found myself was um, in, uh, down in Surrey on the McLaren Formula One racing team. Um, working um, with, and I've been at the, at, the, um, at, the, at the Formula One race prior to this, working with the team that changes the tyres. You've all seen it on the, um, if you're a Formula One racing fans, even if you're not, you understand the concept. If you're not a racing fan, you understand that if you go to the garage, it takes about five hours to change the tyres. 
You also understand that if you go into a racing team, it takes, a, should, if it's really quick, under two seconds, okay? And you get a refuel and you get your, your you know, your windscreen cleaned as well. It's pretty good. Huh? Um, and obviously, um, I found myself in that, in that situation. So that's the first place I found myself thinking, how the hell did I ever get to be here and why am I here? Okay, that's the first place. The second place I found myself was on the aeroplane. Again, I'm a bit sporty at the moment. I'm going to shift away from sport. Um, on the aeroplane coming back from Istanbul in 2005 with the Liverpool Football Club having just won the European Cup. Okay, so that's the second place I found myself thinking, how the hell did I get to be here? Why am I here? It's really weird. I'm the only person I don't recognize. I, you know, it's, it's, it's Matt, okay? So that's the second thing. The third place is I found myself, I'm gonna go from sports to um, organized violence now. I find myself at the, the New York uh, uh, military school um, and I'm now at West Point and I'm working uh, in, a, in a workshop with people who have, who have got guns. Uh, this, I, you know, I noticed that as during the workshop that they all had guns, which was a bit weird because I was a theater director and I noticed myself in those situations. And then um, other examples are I found myself being arrested by the Romanian police as part of a squat and a former home of Ceausescu uh, post um, Ceausescu's uh, uh, execution by the Romanian people. Um, by a series of theatre uh, makers who had been entirely um, oppressed for not to be able to tell any stories or very few stories that were out there um, during the, under the, 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 the reign of the dictatorship, which had pushed it down. So now they were flooding out with their stories and they were occupying. And I was part of an, org of an uh, 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 organization that were theatre makers and they called us in from all over Europe and I thought, oh great, what better way to spend my time than being uh, smacked up by the Romanian police. I loved it. Um, no, nothing against Romanians or any other nation that I've um, been disparaging about. I actually love Romania, by the way. Um, but um, it was quite kind of hardcore. Why were we there? You know, what were we doing? Um, and those, those four, and I'm gonna to come to my all time favorite story. Those are, the, those are the four, the Formula One racing team. Why was I there? The, um, the Istanbul, um, why was I there? The New York military school, why was I there? And why was I arrested by the, um, by the Romanian police? I think I was there, okay, apart from anything, apart from my kind of foolhardy kind of, um, you know, sort of bull in a china shop attitude towards life. I was there to be the wrong person in the right place. I was there to be the wrong person in the right place. And the reason I was there was my naivety, my, my under, because I was asking the questions that no one else was asking. So when they said, you know, we need somebody to come and just, just watch us change the tires, just look at us. And they said, do you know anything about um, racing? Nothing at all. Perfect. He's the person we want. We've got too many experts. We want someone who's so stupid that maybe they'll come up with it, you'll come up with a good idea. And actually, I, I actually think I really helped them because it was about, I re we really worked on and observed their ability to be that duality of focus and awareness at the same time. Now they obviously knew that, but, but I, I really saw them and we did that classic. I mean, you know, it's classic, isn't it? You know, you, you get bored with one instrument in the band and you go and play another instrument and you discover something. So we did, we did roll swap, we did try, you know, it was really exciting. You change from left rear to right front. Now that is a pretty amazing change, let me tell you. Uh, and it was pretty, and it's like, they, some of them couldn't handle it. You know, they've been left rear for like 10 years and suddenly they're doing front right. But it's pretty amazing experience. And you know, you go through that process. Um, and so I was the wrong person in the right place. Um, uh, again, uh, Istanbul, you know, um, I, 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 I was working on, <laughs> mad actually, it was really mad. This is one where you, you, you really do find yourself, we've all been there, where you, you either go to an interview or you just convince people that you can do something. And they, you know, you get imposter syndrome. In my particular case, I got imposter syndrome and it was correct. I was out of my depth. But anyway, um, it was pretty amazing. I ended up teaching uh, footballers and the manager at the time, uh, the uh, post-match interview skills. It was great. Uh, I really had no idea what I was doing. Uh, but I did work out one thing. It wasn't about what to say, it was about what not to say. 
I worked that much out and it was quite good fun. Um, but, um, but, but I did find myself out of my depth. But again, I was kind of like, you know, it was kind of interesting to be the wrong person in the right place. New York Military School, blah, blah, blah. Ceausescu, you can work out why I was there, what I was doing, tell the story. Nothing compares to, forget the previous Russian story. This is before that happened. Five years ago, staring into the world's largest furnace, the world's largest furnace, in one of the world's largest steel factories in the gloriously named Russian town of Magnitogorsk, Magnetic Mountain. Very nasty history, under Stalin, forced labor to get this place built as part of the big plan. They've got the iron ore there, let's get it out. It's kind of the really dark history, but the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I mean, We've all seen extraordinary things. And how small do you feel where, where you just look into this? I mean, it was like looking into the pits of hell. I've never seen anything like it. And they're, they're so, it was so interesting looking at this technology that they, they were developing all of these, you know, gas pipes and girders and all these things going underwater. It was very interesting because they were so massively, massively Russian, like we are the best, we make the best. And then you go around and go, well, these lasers were actually made in Germany because we don't have the technology because <laughs> the, the Germans make the best lasers. And all oh, these cranes were made in Japan because the Japanese make the best cranes. So they did at least kind of understand that they were making great Russian steel, but they also had help from real experts to make it the way they were. Why was I there? I was there because of my naivety. I was the wrong person in the right place. Uh, because I've been teaching at Moscow School of Management and so teaching entrepreneurial thinking and innovation processes, I ended up working on a project for, um, I want to say for Putin, it wasn't quite that bad, but it was, a Rus it was a Russian government project. My mother actually does think I'm a spy, by the way, so, um, and she tried making jokes. And then she, then she sort of, one day she kind of, um, maybe it was post-Brexit argument, she one day she actually changed the tone of voice, you know, and we all know when, when your parents are being serious, she goes, Paul, are, are, you, are you really a theatre director? I was like, mother, you see my work. And she said, I know, that's what I'm worried about. But anyway, that's a personal family joke. But, um, but the, the fact is that I found myself there because Magnitogorsk is one of the classic Russian mono cities, only one thing happening. Okay, so when we think about creativity, we think about this process, there's one thing happening. Steel is coming out, iron ore is coming out of the mountain. Uh, we see it all over Russia, we see it in some other countries, we've seen it in the UK, we've seen it in other parts of the world, of course. You see it in, you know, I've been over to Uruguay and worked with those guys where they've just basically got cattle, but now they've, 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 things have changed a little bit they're now the world's leading kind of working in support of cattle and some of the all the the different medicines etc being developed in Uruguay you know you go to Uruguay and if you um, if you've ever been there again nothing against Uruguayans um, but uh, my horizons have been opened by the fact that you go to dinner I was on an official visit um, part of UKTI about promoting business between um, Uruguay and um, and the UK and you end up going to dinner. I had like, I mean, I've never eaten a steak since because you, you know, you have like official dinner. Dinner is a, is a Malbec and a steak. You go there all the time. And every dinner you get, you get one question thrown at you. How many cattle do you think there are per people in Uruguay? That's their great question. They love to say, to say, and then, and you say, I don't know. I assume there's more and they go, yes, there are more. And every dinner gives you a different answer. Someone says there's 12. Someone says there's 20, someone says there's 40, but all we know are there are more cattle than there are people in Uruguay. So I knew that, I knew that. They have their focus, but they have their diversity as well. So there I am in Magnitogorsk. I'm, I'm working on um, a project called Mono Cities. And the point is that eventually something else is gonna have to happen because the resources are gonna run out. We understand that. It's happened to timber, it's shipping, we look in right across the, so so what so we then look at this process of placemaking, reimagining identity of somewhere, um, and and one of the key things I was there to promote was creative industries. Okay, now I know a lot of you will work in science and technology. It laps over into creative industries. 
I'm not just talking about film and fashion, I'm talking on photography or theatre, I'm talking also going into gaming, software development, this type of creative industry kind of led. And it's classic, isn't it? You take the old factories, Fabrica in Wuj, Tabachka in Koshitsa, um, you take these old buildings, these warehouses, tobacco factories, you gain some investment and you create spaces for creative industries and you open them up. Can you support them? Yes, it's complicated. It's not a panacea, but it does one thing beyond any um, question of a doubt is if it starts to gain some energy, it creates a story and it creates a sense of pride. It creates a story. I lost my momentum on that one. It creates a story. People want to talk about it. They want to visit. They want to talk about it. It's about fashion. It's about identity. It's about pride. And suddenly a creative solution is out of nothing. Now we have the one thing that we want. The question I said to them is how are you going to get young people to stay or come back or come back? Okay, how are you going to get the Romanians to come back to Romania? How are you going to get the, the Russians to come back from Moscow? How are you going to get them to come back? And it's a context for them to have some material support. Now, again, creativity, we understand resources can create great, you know, lack of resources rather can create great opportunity. We'll talk about that, of course. It's classic, isn't it? But by definition, you know, um, having some resources, having somewhere that you can develop your film, that you can, you know, work with your colleagues, you can meet and collaborate, by definition, gives a context, a laboratory to do your experiments. We understand that. Otherwise, you're going to go and do it somewhere else, by definition. Now, sure, you can, you know, sit there with your own Petri dish and try and, you know, do your thing with your protein, but it ain't going to last very long. OK, you're going to have to find some other context. So so it's about placemaking. So I found myself the most the only non-Russian speaker there. I mean, looking into the pit of hell. Um, buy me a glass of wine and I'll tell you another story about Magnitogorsk, but it can only done, be done with alcohol. Talking, um, talking about Magnitogorsk, I mean, I, I would love to send you a glass of wine right now, <laughs> but it's Zoom, so they, they didn't they, they, they haven't made the glass of wine button for the moment. Um, the interesting thing, Magnitogorsk, uh, is production. How, how do you turn production people into creation people? What's the, the edge between production and creation? Is there one to begin well, within with? The, within the, with, well, the, uh, okay, I'm not totally sure I understand the question, but I'll answer it anyway. It's my style. Um, you know, um, the, the, the you know, Magnitogorsk itself is, I mean, it's state, state support, it's a kind of interesting, MMK, Magnitogorsk Mag Metallurgical Company, is, which by the way, it's the MMK ice hockey team, high school, police, tram system, bus, shop, you know, it is like being in a, the Truman Show, um, you know, you go there. Um, that's actually state funded, but it's a private public model, uh, model. they actually are pretty, successful actually there's the, the numbers have gone down but there's still like 30 to 35,000 people employed in a successful um you know profit making uh company they are still successful but they have a lot of um problems there which they need to solve i mean it's incredibly unhealthy there it's incredibly i mean everyone literally i was terrified everyone everyone was yellow it was it was like it was it was really scary so they've got problems to solve themselves medical problems environmental problems we understand the problem we try and find a solution and so we go but 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 that my 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 job there sasha was to encourage them to think about how are they going to get those young people to stay so in terms of their main core model they were successful and there's loads of spin-offs from it there's loads of spin-offs and there's loads of i mean it's, it's successful but I was talking about the general population, the level of education, the relationship between the university and the, you know, and the, um, and the, the company, the relationship between the university and the, and the, the art scene and the, the science scene. What is it? Where is science? And, you know, so what are these relationships? Who is putting their head above and saying, we need to do other things. There are brilliant people here. You know, you ain't stupid if you run places like that. There's no way. And we understand, you know, 
You know, Russians, people, Russians are great physicists and chemists and scientists. They're great, you know. I mean, there's that old story, isn't there? It's a, it's a silly, silly story. It's completely not true. But you have to do it every time. It's like in the contract. That's what made me sign the contract. You have to tell the story. You're all going to nod now. You've heard the story before, but you can't. It's, it's irresistible about, you know, NASA wanting to develop the pen, isn't it? You're all nodding now. You know, to develop the pen. It's an apocryphal story. I'm sure it didn't happen. You know, that they, they developed the pen. They spend X millions of dollars trying to get the pen not to freeze and to be working gravity and all this kind of thing, and then try and get it to work. And they got something to work. And the Russians just said, "Let's use a pencil." Okay, it's classic. It's, you know, it's a classic story. I'm sure it's complete. I'm sure the lead would have like flown around and taken people's eyes out. But but the point of it is, sometimes incredibly simple stuff sits in front of us, even from the most brilliant, brilliant people. And if you've got, you know, it's classic, isn't it? You got ten million dollars to develop your pen, or you've got a dollar to develop your pencil. You know uh, your idea. You end up with a pencil. You know due to scarcity, and I think we all understand that. You know, on that note, on that note, by the way, to get that play from Russia, from the UK to Russia, I, you know, I, I've, I've spent I've spent upwards of West End shows like hundred thousand pounds on um, on sets and scenery. You can do that because I was never going to get shipped over there. So I made the entire set out of wooden pallets, which I knew were universally available everywhere in the world. And so we just ordered 36 pallets to be delivered to a theatre in, um, in, in Voronezh. And of course, we had 36 pallets in the UK. They were universal European um, you know, size. So, uh, and, and, and it's hilarious, isn't it? Everyone says, that's your best set ever. <laughs> best set you've ever done it's 36 pallets but they were incredibly and then you you because of you know scarcity you create something you create something new i'll keep going for another 10 minutes guys and then um and then you can um, talk about it so 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 um just i was just making a list of certain things again you you kind of understand this why you know why are why is estonia such a great place for you know certain startups like Skype and things like that. If you look at if you go back in in Estonia, you see that that they the kids when they go to school they play chess. When they go to school they do mathematics. That's the great thing to do is maths, maths, maths. And they're playing chess. And they actually it's in it's in there. They really promote maths. You know it's like the thing to do. And everyone you know starts to kind of it becomes kind of math contest. And you know and, and Estonians suddenly are great mathematicians. They're great. They, there's there's a culture. Why are there no Indian boxing champions? Why are there like dozens and dozens of Kazakhstan boxing champions? Because they're because they it's, it's, it's ridiculous. There's a billion people in India, but there's no boxing champions because they don't, they've not created a culture a question they've not promoted it whereas Kazakhstan they are they're all you know they love it so there's maths in Estonia there's you know Czech Republic you know where I've just um, been you know they had a president that was a playwright the president it was a playwright so it's so obviously you know there's a culture there's a, a sense of storytelling and all of this is about what stories are you telling what questions are you asking so so I'm very interested in these kind of paradoxes um, these kind of dualities that exist certainly for my life you know, and I talked a little bit about being, you know, both a creator or a, um, uh, an adapter. I decided to go along the lines of being a creator. So I always work on the blank piece of paper and try and encourage and question always. What question am I asking about the status quo? Which people am I going to get involved in? I think it's pretty obvious that the, the personnel that we work with on a creative personnel, how much are you framing the vision for something and how much are you allowing people to, to infect, change, challenge that vision without it becoming chaos? You know, we all understand disruption is a very, very important um, part of creative processes, disrupting norm, creating new patterns, but always it is like what, um, you know, which people are you incorporating into your teams to create the work? Why was I in all those places? Because I was thinking differently. What, you know, and if you only by definition work with people that think you're uh, the same as you, um, or the audiences grow up with you, you know, you see audiences, you start off, you're 20, everyone in the audience is 20, you're 40, everyone's 40, you're 60, everyone's 60. You know, you have to change that to, to, to work with younger people, work with people who are better than you. You know, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually a really very good lighting designer, but I always work with people who are better lighting designers than me. I can talk to them, I can challenge them, but I get someone who's better than me because there's no point otherwise. Get someone who thinks differently. And mostly, the most, most people who are better than me at most things are younger than me, by definition. Um, you know, when we're thinking about our creative processes, our work, the space we work in is a huge factor. I've talked about it a little bit already today. 
and the space you work in. What is that? What are the limitations? What are the opportunities? Um, you know, are you outdoors? Are you indoors? Are you in somewhere that is well resourced, badly resourced? You know, what is it? There's no right or wrong. Is it comfortable? Is it uncomfortable? It is freaking uncomfortable if you're squatting in one of Ceausescu's former houses and trying to, which is now like gutted and trying to make theatre. That ain't comfortable, but boy, it does drive you to want to tell your stories. And the fact that the people had to come in over a fence, they had to want to come in, you had to really make it work, is not comfortable. It was not comfortable. But don't get me wrong, I, I, I love, you know, I love sitting down in a nice comfortable seat and watching a nice piece of opera or something. I love it. I feel I, I, I can drift away. I don't have to sit in the freezing cold, but, you know, what space are you choosing to work in? How much time are you allocating to things? Yeah. Um, you know, I actually feel very, you know, the, the play that I talked about earlier, which is called Bliss, by the way, we called it Bliss. I don't know if it's ironic or literal. I, I still don't know. But the play, the Platinum play is called Bliss. I'm actually, I'm actually quite depressed about it right now because I had it right in the front of my head and it was, it was a nightmare pushing me, pushing me to get this show to Russia, to get it back to the UK, to do all these things, answer all these questions. And now it's sitting there waiting for next year for nothing. I feel totally uninspired by it. You know, I can't, I can't even look at an image to try and think how can I, you know, tell the story in a different way. So time and of course scale, you know, scale. And when I, when I work with companies, when I work with companies, I'm working with a few companies right now, and I just, you know, they all have their ideation models, they all have their, their, their investment model, they work their teams, whether they're in pharmaceuticals, whether they're in, um, you know, uh, utilities, whatever it might be, they're all looking for, you know, design thinking models, brainstorming models, you know, I like the, I like the model here in Cambridge, or with you guys in Cambridge, TTP, you guys will know technology partnership. I like the technology partnership model. I work with them where the, where you, the, the guys are all engineers essentially and um, guys and girls are all engineers and they can go into a bidding process for a pot of money to, to bid, to work in teams, to, to get, you know, to come up with great ideas so they can get out of what they're doing and do something else. You know, it's like the Google model where you can work a day on your own project kind of thing. And I like that. I like that. Um, you know, I like that model. You know, you, you, you kind of think of the scale of things you're working on. I'm very interested in this kind of, my, my model of scale that I work with people is nudge, shift and radical thinking, you know, and it's, it's a kind of obvious thing, um, but I really do, when we're looking at the problem that we want to solve or, you know, the evolution of an idea or just a question we want to ask, I'm interested in what would be a little nudge of this idea? What would be a real big shift of, you know, thinking of, you know, a product, whatever it might be, and what would be totally radical? It's obvious, we talk about brainstorming, we can wear different color hats or whatever methodology you want to do. I'm interested in time, scale, obviously resources. I explained to you my best ever, apparently, according to the critics, was a bunch of pallets, you know, after I spent 100,000 pounds on a, you know, a load of stuff that would swing in and swing out and everyone just, I just, you know, they couldn't be bothered. So I, I, I'm not going to talk to you necessarily about, um, you know, about um, why, uh, you know, uh, why, why we need to be creative. I think it's obvious we have necessity. Um, you know, I, I think it's pretty obvious to say, but I'll just say anyway, you know, the, the reason we have a cup is because the water would run through our fingers. We need a vessel to, to collect the water. It's, it, it's a necessity, you know, and so on and so forth. And we see evolution of ideas. I do like that, Steve Jobs. I told you I would get to Steve Jobs eventually. I couldn't help it. I can't help myself. I do love the idea, Steve Jobs saying, you know, people don't know what they want until we show them. I do like that, actually. I like the idea that, that they're looking to go into new markets to challenge people, ways of thinking. It's the old, you know, Ford car, isn't it? You know, that you, 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 people would just want a faster horse or whatever he said, you know. I love that. I love the idea that, you know, it's, it's evolving. Another great sports, oh God, I've fallen into the, I feel like I'm doing a lecture now, I, I, but here's a good one. Here's a good one. It's from ice hockey player Wayne Gretzky, who's all time greatest ever, National Hockey League player, you know, all time greatest ever. And it's a classic one about um, innovation and innovation thinking. And they asked him, why were you so good? Why were you so good? And, he, and you, know, you understand ice hockey, it's in a rink, you know, got the puck and whatever. And he said, I would go into the space where the puck will be, not where it was. In other words, he was creating new spaces, new opportunities for other people to see 
So in other words, he was signaling that he would go into a new space where nowhere else was. He wasn't chasing the puck. He wasn't following the puck. He wasn't saying, give the puck to me. He was signaling to put the puck where he will then go, to challenge it into new spaces, to think about new buildings, to think about new concepts, think about new relationships and to push it. You know, um, you know, uh, uh, another, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm here now, I might as well bloody just carry on with the quotes, you know. Uh, I, I, I do think this, um, you know, this, if you start with the idea of creativity from Einstein and intelligence being fun, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, intelligence having fun, I, I, which is fine, and you can debate what creativity is. I really love, the, the, the one that I love the most is, is, is innovation, a definition of innovation is is um, creativity that leads to an invoice. I've always loved that. I've always loved that quote. I just think you know it's it's not quite right, but I do love it as a concept. That actually, this creative idea is usable. It's useful. It's specific. It's real. It's someone's going to buy it or engage with it, or it's going to ha- you know as opposed to you know. And you can go through and you can talk about the bono and you know creating new patterns and new opportunities. You can talk about all this thing. Um, but for me, I suppose you know as I um, as I glance at my um, notes written on the Rotslav tram, um, I, you know, I've written down, I mean, I think I, I talked to you a lot, um, Sasha, and I'll do the last couple of minutes here, guys, and then you can ask me some questions or, or pretend that the Zoom is broken or something. Um, you know, and listen, you, you know, we understand divergent <laughs> thinking, opening up, we understand convergent thinking, you know, we understand that, we understand that, you know, there's resource allocation, that there's opportunity, but, but I, I, I uh, you know, I'm really interested in this final thought, I suppose, in, in what I've talked about today. Um, and, you know, and I've, I, I guess I haven't really divided it up into art, science and nature. You know, I understand that, that, you know, there's, we talk about necessity, you know, I am coming across a lot of people who are saying we, by necessity, we have to innovate and be creative. Climate change. I see that all the time. I hear it all the time. I understand. I'm starting to come to come realization that, that I need to reject my naivety, embrace some kind of more sophisticated thinking around this and to work with people because it is important and it is a real problem that we are really having to, to challenge and, and come up with creative solutions. I understand that. Um, you know, I'm not just talking about art and I understand that science right now is, is, is having to be always, you know, on the forefront of creative, um, you know, processes. It's right, happening right now with vaccines, whatever it might be. I understand that. I understand the role of failure and experience, you know, listening to the lady um, this morning, I said, you know, a, a proper little Englishman, you know, you still have to listen to Radio 4, even if you're in Poland, you know, it's like you have to listen to the day program. And then you listen to the science, is it science this morning, the lady from Oxford? Um, very Life scientific. Yeah, yeah. It's, I love that program. I love that program. She's very interesting, you know, she, she's very interesting. And, um, you know, just talking about, she, she said, you know, they said, oh, you've got this thing going, it's taking you just like six months. She goes, yeah, well, it actually took us 25 years to get to the point where we could actually do it in six months, you know. And it isn't just by accident, it's by experience, it's by failure, it's by creating models and context and understanding. And then when the, the necessity, the necessity comes, we are ready, you know, we have the, 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 the mindfulness to, to then activate on that on an action against that um against those necessities but the final thing i suppose when i talk to businesses when i talk to scientists when i talk to artists and i talk about um you know creative processes and sure i'll talk to people about literal creative processes if you want but i'm I'm much more interested in the culture of creativity and what i call the atmosphere of creativity I didn't come up with the word atmosphere, it's already in the dictionary, okay? But I do love the fact that there's an atmosphere of creativity where people are asking questions. And I'm constantly saying to people, what questions are you asking? What questions are you asking of yourselves, of your products, of your services, of your technologies, of the world as you see it? Um, you know, when I go to my um, students at Cambridge, um, uh, what are you reading? What are you watching? If you're all listening to the same thing, if you're all, you know, walking around with the same music in your, your headphones, you're all going to have the same thoughts because obviously it's experience that brings us to a certain point where we can have some sort of um, reaction to the world and that atmosphere of, of, of creativity, whether it's creating, um, you know, goals or creating resources allocation or taking away resource allocation. You know, it's classic, isn't it? I taught entrepreneurship for many years. And you always say, what's the most entrepreneurial place in the world? You know, they, they always change the, the, 
thing, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's one minute is Lagos because, you know, it's completely chaotic. So everyone has to survive or, you know, and then all suddenly now it's North Korea because actually, despite the fact that you're not allowed to be an entrepreneur, everyone's an entrepreneur just to survive, you know, and so it is and so on and so forth. The point is that, that we encourage an atmosphere of creativity and I'm a firm believer in, and what I've always done in my creative life, apart from the fact I have creativity in the title, which, you know, I suppose helps, is that I've always gone somewhere to get inside somewhere. That's what I'm doing today. That's what I was doing yesterday. That's what I'll do in Cambridge, to go into an idea physically, practically, to find an opportunity to be a kind of magnet for ideas to come to me, people to come to me, to build trust in me and my team, and when someone comes with an idea to me, um, I, I, to not reject that idea out of hand, but actually just put your hand in your pocket and just to say, look, here's some money to kind of just to keep, keep you so you can afford the tins of baked beans and loaves of white bread as a starving artist to develop your idea. And then, um, you know, see, see if we can make something of it. Okay, I'll stop there. Paul Bourne for you tonight. Uh, uh, please press the, the hand clap button right now or cl hand clap in the middle. <coughs> Nobody stick uh, up the middle finger button. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can see something. which bastards like me. <laughs> something which I find amazing uh, with you, Paul, is that, is right, that uh, you remind me of these, uh, of these um, Japanese martial arts teachers who are uh, showing the martial art rather than, than teaching the martial art. Um, and, and you're a master storyteller, so I, I really love the way you, you bring us uh, to, to various cities and to various places and to various situations. There's quite a lot to unpack in, in what you talked about tonight, like the uh, storytelling, the uh, you know, daring to start from you know, inception of something, something small and then making it bigger by meeting people, uh, being the, the wrong person in the right place, just uh, putting yourself in, in, in dangerous situations, in scarcity, in atmosphere and all of that. So quite a lot uh, of, of uh, really interesting um, aspects of creativity tonight. Thank you.